Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Blessing you for all, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take. You give and take away. You give and take away. And my heart will choose to say. the third 
break of dawn, the sun of heaven rose again. A trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Sing, oh, praise the Lord. his name today Lord we need you more than ever every day every morning I just want to say thank you for the, allowing us to, to live a new day we just want to confess and say it again uh, we need you we need you more than ever in times of trouble Lord we need you
teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll follow you. Oh, Jesus, you're my hope and say. And when I cannot stand, I'll follow you. Oh, Jesus, you're my hope and say. Open up my eyes and 
trust in you alone and I will not be shaken oh I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I God, um, we, we just come before you, God, acknowledging that you are good. God, acknowledging that you are the thing that we can build our lives on. Um, God, your, your love is so, so great, so big, um, so much that we don't even understand sometimes. Um, God, I, I'm so thankful that we serve a God who is so much bigger than we are. Um, I, I just want to pray today, God, that as we sit in the seats, as we are um, engaging with each other, engaging with your word, um, God, that we are moved, that we're changed, that our, our hearts are open to what the Holy Spirit is, is telling us this morning. Um, God, I, I pray that your word does not fall on deaf ears, God, but that um, we are um, really internalizing this beautiful letter, this love letter that you've given us in the Bible. Um, God, I, I just pray that our, our hearts are continually being transformed as we sit at your feet. Um, God, we love you, we praise you, we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, North Hills. It's good to be with you guys this morning. My name is Pastor Zach Schiffer, and I'm so glad that you joined us for worship this morning. Today, we are continuing on in our series on Passover. We're continuing on looking today at the elements. What are, what are the elements of Passover? What are, the, what are those items that are symbolic, that are pregnant with meaning? And you might be asking yourself, why, uh, why are we talking about this? Why are we looking at this old Jewish tradition? And, and I have a really good reason for that. As we, as we work towards Easter, we're preparing our hearts. We're preparing our hearts for the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior, of our Deliverer, which is where we're going with today's message as we look at these elements. We're going to start tying Passover, as we progress towards Easter, we're going to start tying Passover to Jesus. You see, God was creating a type. He was creating a model that we could recognize, as we talked about last week, that we could recognize in our, from our history and we could celebrate in today so that we could recognize our future. He's creating a model that we could recognize our future, our, our, when Jesus comes, our, our Savior, and also recognize probably a whole lot of our future beyond as we walk in the newness of life. And so there's a lot of meaning here. And for us to fully grasp what Jesus was teaching us when he walked the earth, we need some stepping stones, right? We need some stepping stones to help us get from where we were and cross the creek to where God wants us to be, crossing the Jordan River, if you will, another type, right, that we see in scripture. And so instead of asking you guys to make one gigantic leap across an entire river all in one jump, we're building stepping stones so that you can make a couple of small jumps to get to where Jesus wants us to be in our hearts and our minds, what he wants us to understand so that we believe and we trust in him as our deliverer. So let's, uh, let's pray together 
and then we'll jump into scripture for this week. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these these markers along the road, these signposts. We thank you for these stepping stones that help us grow into the people you want us to be. We thank you for celebrations where, where we can um, experience with joy our relationship with you. Father, we pray that today you would open up our eyes and our minds and our hearts to what you have to show to us. Father, we pray that we would hear from you through your word this morning as we read your scriptures. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us this instruction, Father. And we thank you for being with us here this morning. Amen. Okay, if you have your Bibles with you today or if you have a device with you, you can turn uh, to Exodus chapter 12. We're gonna be looking at a big block of scripture today as we read through some instructions for Passover. Uh, if you're in your, you know, on your phones or your devices, you can turn them on now and turn, open up those apps uh, to join us there. So that's Exodus chapter 12 where we're turning to. And so this is the, where the Passover is about to, to happen, the very first one, the, the inauguration. And so the instructions here actually look just slightly different than what we read last week from Deuteronomy where, where Moses was um, reminding people of the instructions. And now that they're free people and they've left the slavery of Egypt, they can, they can celebrate a little bit differently. Some examples. Uh, we're going to read that they need to be ready to run. They need to be ready to go. They need to, have, they need to eat this dinner with, the, with their sandals on and their cloaks tucked into their belt, like they're ready to move. You'll see that here. But in later v- instructions, it's, it's more of a celebration. It's more of a remembrance and, and they eat it sitting around a table lounging on pillows right? They're, they're leaning, they're leaning over the table. They're laughing. They're celebrating. It's, it's, it's a different tone. And that's why we're looking at this one today. This is, this is the first, this is the inauguration. So we're going to read through this. Um, I'm going to start and stop as we go through. And so please, please just try to keep up and, and give me, give me some grace. If I start in the wrong spot or something like that, I'll try to, I'll try to keep my finger in the right place as we go, but we're going to read this together. And we're going to see what God is teaching us and what we can learn from this passage today. All right. Exodus chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb. So that's our first element we're going to talk about in just a moment. He's to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. So it's a single lamb. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people they are. So plan your meals. You're going to this is a community event. This, there's no lone rangers here. They bring, bring in your neighbors, plan around your meal, and, and, and get ready to eat this lamb, okay? You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with, which, with what each person will eat. That's what we kind of just talked about. Verse 5. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. And you may take, you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Let's pause right there and talk about this for a second. There's very specific instructions here for how to choose this animal, who this animal is to be, and, and, and why you choose this animal. And so, a lamb is, is a baby sheep or, or a baby goat is, is, you know, an acceptable substitution here. Um, and it says without defect. Well, how do we figure out if, if this, this baby is without defect? Well, that, the clue there is in the timing. You see, the festival is supposed to be held on the 14th day. You might have remembered that from last week's reading. But they say that you're supposed to select this lamb on the 10th day, if we look back to verse 3 right there. So there's this four-day period between those two where they can inspect the animal. 
They can examine the animal to make sure it's without defect. They have, they have a, a little window here to, uh, to, to make sure that they've double checked because this is serious business. This is, this is unto the Lord, right? The, the, the God of the universe. And so they have their initial check, kind of like picking a Christmas tree where we go look at the tree and we're, we're in the lot and we're kind of checking it over. And what inevitably happens to Alyssa and I is we get that tree home and we go to put it up and we realize it's not quite as symmetrical as we hoped. It's not quite as perfect. And so we have to trim the tree a little bit. We have to turn it so that just the perfect side is showing, right? And likewise, these Israelites, they would take this little lamb home with them. And, and the, when, as I was reading and studying, tradition has it that they would actually take this lamb into their house with them. That they would bring it under their own roof and they would take care of them. Like verse 6 started, take care of them until the 14th day of the month. And what happens when we take a cute little animal home? Well, you be, better be careful not to name it, right? And, and because you get attached. You start to fall in love. You see the beauty and the life that is within this, this, this small animal, right? When we bring a puppy home or a kitten, we instantly fall in love with them. We, the whole family ends up spending time gathering around this little critter, right? We can't wait to, to come home and see him again and see the goofy antics of this little, this little baby animal. This lamb was likewise a centerpiece for Jewish families. And it became a centerpiece for this tradition, right? There's a lot of instructions here. It's saying a lot about this lamb. But the sad part is, at the end of verse six there, all the members of the community of Israel had to come together at a certain time at twilight and slaughter these little lambs. Can you imagine the grief if you had brought a little lamb into your house for about four days and your kids had started falling in love with it? Can you imagine the grief of having to take that lamb away and go slaughter this lamb? How, how that would hurt the little hearts in your home. How butchering that animal would, would bring you some, some sadness and some remorse. This was... A, a festival, a celebration, but there was a tough reality that the Israelites had to face. And we're going to get to that a little bit later on. So let's pick up in verse 7. It says, then they are to take some blood. They would, they would slit the throat of the lamb and they would have to catch some blood in a small bowl so that they could, so that they could keep that blood. And in later days, so, so they're doing this here in, in this first time in Egypt, but in later days, this was done at the temple where everybody would take their lambs to the temple, the temple mount, and the priests would assist with kind of doing this correctly. And, and, and you had to take some of that blood and you had to take it home with you because the next part is very, very important to the story. You had to take, verse seven again, then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. So they are to take some of that blood and they have to kind of strangely decorate the house where they live. They have to, they have to put it up there and leave it up there as a sign of this celebration. It, it's, it's, it's odd to us, but it's crazy significant. And we're going we're to read on and we're going to get to that significance. But they are to decorate this way for, their, for this celebration before they eat the dinner together. Okay? So then that same night, they're to eat the meat roasted over the fire. So God had a specific way for them to cook this meat. Um, later on, he'll, he'll remind us of this. He has a specific way to cook this lamb. And then he says, how should you eat it? What are you going to eat it with? Well, he wants you, them to eat it, uh, eat it with bitter herbs and with bread made without yeast. It says, do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, 
but roast it over a fire. He says it again. With the head, legs, and internal organs, really in its entirety, right? You haven't left anything out there. You're to roast all of that over the fire. And then verse 10, do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in hand, eat it in haste. Like they had to gobble their food, right? Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. This lamb was a central part of this celebration, a significant part of their deliverance. And, and so God made it significant. He made it not easy, not easy to overlook, not something you could easily forget because you're going to experience this. You're going to experience bringing this lamb into your house and falling in love with it and thinking it's so cute. You're going to experience the heartbreak of removing this lamb from your house and then taking it to slaughter it. You are going to experience carrying it back to your home after slaughter and, and, and using part of that to decorate your home with blood on the doorposts. Now remember, this first time, they're leaving. They, they know they're getting ready to leave. And so probably not that big of a deal. Like, oh yeah, we're, we're leaving this house anyways. Who cares about uh, like this blood graffiti we're gonna put on the house? Maybe it was a little bit easier the first time, but think about later on when the Jewish people now free are decorating their doorposts with the blood of a lamb. I wonder, did they leave it up all year? Did they wipe and clean that off later? I don't, I don't know. But that was, that was what God called them out to do so that they would not forget this moment, so that they would grasp the significance of their deliverance from slavery to freedom, okay? Let's look at verse 12. On the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood of that lamb there. The blood will be a sign for you on your houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. The blood is the sign for deliverance. Your house is also symbolic. Your house where, where the blood is on the doorpost is a place for your covering, right? It's all, it's all significant. It's, it's all an experience that they're experiencing. All right, verse 14, it says, this is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you, sell, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. All right, celebrate, commemorate. These, these are important words because so far in these instructions, that doesn't seem like a celebration to me, right? It's hard. It's difficult. It's, it's, it's emotionally painful in some ways, right? It's dirty, hard work, right? It's, it's not easy to cook a whole lamb. That's, that's a big meal to prepare. This isn't pop something in the microwave, right? Like build a fire, create a bed of coals, prop up the lamb, arrange the pieces, cook it over the fire. It's a long process probably takes hours, right? A lot of work. You are going to remember this. Verse 14 again. This is a day you are to commemorate. You're going to remember this. You're going to commemorate it. And for generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. As I was studying for this week's message, um, I looked at what is the traditional Jewish um, Seder dinner. That, that word basically means order, like the order of celebration. And there's a book put out by uh, different, you know, Jewish rabbis and things that's called the Haggadah. And this is the instructions. It's the, hey, this is everything we want to teach and we want to cover as we celebrate in order this story, as we commemorate this story. And over time, they have added great traditions to it. Other items, other pieces of the meal, right? Like a roasted egg or, or um, uh, 
uh, celery pieces or things like that that we don't see listed here in these instructions because they're commemorating, because they're celebrating this moment. And one of the elements that we don't really see in these instructions right here that has become such a crucial element for the Jewish people and that Jesus celebrated and he used in his Passover is the element of wine. And wine throughout scripture is used for celebrations, right? We see it in wedding ceremonies where, the, where they talk about drinking wine. We see it um, in, in um, uh, um, places where um, uh, it's used to describe in a psalm that it makes your heart glad, right? It's used for celebration. And so when, when God commanded them, commanded them to celebrate, people said, well, we, we got we to gotta have some fun too. How, how are we going to celebrate this and not just commemorate it? How are we going to um, look, make this a, a way that we look forward to this? And so families have passed this down. They've, they've owned it. They've made it their own so that, so that it can be something that they use as a teaching tool for their children, that they remember, that they commemorate, but also something that everyone is looking forward to, to doing together as a family, right? A household and that kind of thing. And so I want to actually turn over to Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 and 8 right here. We're going to flip over there for just a minute because as part of the order of a Passover celebration, uh, an adopted tradition is that there are four glasses of wine or grape juice, four glasses that are, that are celebrated um, remembering what God promised, remembering what God did. And so God, in chapter 6, he promises them deliverance. He promises his people that I'm going to deliver you, and that's what they're celebrating. They're remembering this through these glasses of wine. So let's look at uh, uh, Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. All right? Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with, a, and with mighty acts of judgment. Verse 7, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians." And I will bring you to the land I swore with an uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So this is, this is what Moses came to them and said. This is what's going to happen. He came, sorry, he came to the Israelites. He came to the Israelites and said, this is what's going to happen. This is going to be amazing. We are going to see this promise fulfilled where we're going back to the promised land. You will be free. This is right before all the plagues. And the Israelite people didn't believe him. They actually, it says that they didn't listen to him. They just shrugged it off, brushed it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be nice. Not going to happen, right? They, they weren't believing yet. They weren't believing and trusting in their deliverer, God. They needed to experience him. And so some really rough experiences came in, right, to, to Egypt where there, these plagues are happening. These plagues are happening where God is showing off his power and delivering them. He's, he's confronting, as Jared taught us, he's confronting the, the gods of Egypt. He's confronting Pharaoh himself. He's confronting that pride and stuff. And, and he's saying, I'm going to be the deliverer. I'm going to be the deliverer. I'm going to be the deliverer. And so as, as the Passover is celebrated to this day, Jewish people and, and Christians who celebrate Passover drink these four cups of wine to celebrate this promise. Back in verse six, the, they, they have four cups. In the, in the first cup, they remember that I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I'm gonna bring you out then they have a second cup. I will free you from being slaves to them. You are no longer slaves. And for the Jewish people, they, they use this as a reminder that we are not going to be a people who rejoice over the suffering of others. But we will mourn with them and we will rejoice in the blessings that God has given to us, but not over others' sufferings. 
third, the, the third glass is, is about redemption. I will, f- uh, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will redeem you is that third cup. That third cup is tied to the shed blood of the lamb because that's in, back over in Exodus chapter 12, verse 23, he says, when he sees the blood on the tops and the sides of the door frame, he will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses. He's going to buy your freedom with that blood. He's going to redeem you. Fourth, the fourth cup is a cup of praise. I will take you as my own people. This is wedding language. This is marriage language that like a groom would say to a bride. And so that's, that's celebration language. It's party time is what he's saying. And so they commemorate that with the fourth cup, the fourth glass of wine. And so this is how they celebrate. They remember and then they celebrate in their presence so that they can recognize their future like we talked about last week. So let's turn back to chapter 12 and let's continue on through these instructions. Okay? Uh, Verse 15. Chapter 12, verse 15. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. Let's pause right here. So they, they talked about the Passover meal and there's actually kind of three celebrations, festivals, right in a row right here that happen that are often referred to just as Passover, even though God kind of separates them out into three different pieces. And so there's the Passover meal, the Passover festival and celebration. Then there's this week of uh, the, the um, festival of unleavened bread. And then on the tail end, which we're really not going to talk about here, but on the tail end, there's one more festival, one more celebration tacked on there, which is the, the festival of first fruits, celebrating like something new, celebrating the future, right? Like we remembered our past, we celebrated, and now we're looking towards the future, okay? So that's what we're talking about here now. For seven days, you are to eat bread made without yeast. Sorry, I'm in verse 15. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses, For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred sacred assembly and another one on the seventh day. Do Do no work at all on all of, sorry, do no work at all on these days, can't read, except to prepare food for everyone to eat. Okay, when you get a whole bunch of people together, to celebrate something and you say, let's prepare some food for everyone to eat, you can bet your paycheck that, uh, that we're gonna come up with some traditions, we're gonna have our favorite foods to eat, we're gonna come up with some great stuff to experiment with, we're gonna, we're gonna have some fun with this, right? This is where those kind of those other elements of Passover and stuff I think kind of worked their way in where parents were saying, how do we make this even more significant? How do, we, how do we give this even richer meaning specifically to remember the stories, to remember what God has done for us, all right? Because they had some time. They had a week. Just cook and hang out for a week and eat it, right? Um, except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Verse 17. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because, right? That's always like a wait, pay attention word because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. The unleavened bread, both at Passover and then this festival of unleavened bread, is to remember the story. Because on this day, I'm bringing you out of Egypt, right? Not later, not in a month. Don't, you know, plan to pack the U-Haul, you know, on that weekend or whatever and invite people over. No, on this day. On this day, we're taking off. So this unleavened bread that's part of the Passover meal and part of the festival of unleavened bread that follows is all about like we're, we're hitting the road. We're traveling. The, the um, original meaning to the Israelites of, of unleavened bread was that, okay, we have to get ready to go. We, we don't have time to let our bread rise. So the leavening is that, is that agent that, that helps bread rise. It's like our yeast 
um, um, in, in modern days, I, I would assume that they were using more of like a natural starter, like a sourdough starter uh, at this time. But, but we have to be ready to go. And so we're going to prepare to go, but it's going to be pretty fast, pretty fast turnaround that we're hitting the road. Another thing about this unleavened bread is that it was very dry, almost like a cracker. So in the, in the days to follow after we leave, you're going to have seven days of eating this stuff to commemorate like that you were hitting the road and you had, you had some rations ready to hit the road, right? This, this dry bread that, that, you know, would, would last because if you're hiking, you're not baking, right? <laughs> you're not, you're not sitting around waiting for bread to rise. You've got some in your pack and we're going, right? It was right after this story that they hike out to the desert and then they encounter the Red Sea and then God brings them through the Red Sea and then they travel further, right? So you're ready to go. You have this unleavened bread because it's on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Let's keep reading um, second half of verse 17 there. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for your generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses. Why? No yeast. See, yeast is this, is this thing where even though it's a small thing, it will permeate everything, right? When you put a small bit of starter into a dough, that yeast starts to grow and populate and it grows throughout the whole loaf to eat the sugars in there and to create the leavening, the, the gases that, that help bread rise. And so a small bit permeates the whole loaf. And God's saying like, no, my people, I am pure and my people will be pure. My people will be set apart. My people will be different. And, and so we're taking all of this out of our houses and we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Let's, uh, let's read um, the rest of this kind of little section here. 18, in the first month you are to eat the bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses and anyone, whether foreigner or native born who eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. How many times did he repeat himself right there? and say it over and over again, no yeast, no, no bread with yeast, nothing with yeast, unleavened bread only, over and over and over again. I think it's a big deal. I think it's a very big deal. And you, you have to experience it to understand it. So what the, the Jewish people did celebrating Passover is they had a preparation day. And they would remove all the yeast from their homes and they would do kind of like spring cleaning where they would clean all the dishes to make sure that there was no leftover yeast on like a dish. Maybe they would even have to remove and throw out some that were like not able to clean well enough. I mean, they were serious about this, right? And then, and then they would go through their whole house because what if they had left a breadcrumb somewhere and, and, you know, and it had been dribbled off in a corner like God was serious about this. He gave us very clear instructions. He repeated himself multiple times. He was very clear about this. And in doing so, in searching, you had time. As you cleaned, it's kind of menial task. You had time to think about this story. You're experiencing it. You're living it out, right? You're preparing. And, and later in the celebration as traditions formed and stuff like that, a father would take a candle and he'd light a candle because again, a lot of this was happening in the evening as they're like saying like, hey, tonight's the night. Like we're gonna have Passover, we're gonna celebrate Passover and then we're taking off, right? And so he'd light a candle in the evening, it's dark. Probably get down on his hands and knees close to the floor, looking for that crumb that might be sitting there that can cast a shadow with that candle, right? And then he would take a feather, something gentle, something light, and, and he would brush those crumbs and he'd lead his children on this hunt. And so later some moms would leave some crumbs specifically around somewhere so that the family would have something to hunt for because mom was probably pretty proud of how good of a job she did cleaning everywhere, right? Moms usually lead the cleaning kind of in this traditional family sense, right? But they took this very seriously. They wanted to experience it, to commemorate, to celebrate what? Their deliverance. 
their deliverance. All right, let's pick up in verse 21. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, go at once, select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop. This is a, a weed, it's a, it's a small herb kind of plant. Take a, uh, a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood. There's the significance again, the blood. In the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. Verse 23. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of your door frame and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. What's going on here? There's three parties involved. Let's recognize those, right? There's the families in verse 21. Take your families, go into the house, leave the blood on the door frame, go into the house, right? Close the door, stay inside. Do not go outside. There's a covering, right? There's the symbolic covering of protection, right? And then there's two more parties. So there's the family is one party. Then there's the Lord is the second party. And then there's a third party, the destroyer. This word destroyer is, is the same word used as deceiver elsewhere, like when we're describing the snake. He's the one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy, as described later in the New Testament. He's the one who wants to eliminate the image bearers of God. We were created in God's image. He wants to eliminate those image bearers. And the people here had a choice to make. Here we're getting down to the real stuff right here. The people here had a choice to make. They knew something bad was coming, right? They knew they needed deliverance. And so they went through these great lengths to say, yes, I want to accept this deliverance. I will paint this blood on my door. But they had to trust. They had to trust in their deliverer. And you say, how, how? If it was you and I, do you think painting some red paint around your door frame would protect you from, you know, a bad guy breaking into your house? Think about it a sec. You'd probably be like, no, right? So we had to trust, if somebody told us to do that, we would have to trust their word that that would work. We'd have to trust their word that that would be the signpost for the deliverer and that that would protect us. Right? When you go into the house, think of a doorway. Maybe you're at home and you're, and you're sitting in your living room right now. Think of your front door. When you go into that house, if there was blood on your door frame on the outside, you wouldn't see it, right? It's outside of your sight picture and you have to trust. Here's a bunch of people who are eating a meal in haste. They're eating bitter herbs. They're eating... Uh, um, uh, uh, the lamb they're eating this unleavened bread they're eating it in a hurry they've got their shoes on right like they didn't wash up and sit down they've got their shoes on they've got their their uh, their cloaks tucked in their bags are packed and they're ready to go and they're sitting there probably almost cowering inside their homes hoping that the that the the deliverer will protect them from the destroyer. That that trust, trusting in that blood on their door frame to deliver them from evil. For those of you who are believers in Jesus Christ, you're probably starting to see some parallels. That we have to trust the Lord Jesus Christ with our lives to be delivered from our sin. We have to trust in his blood shed for us to be delivered for us. And you might start seeing these parallels. I told you that this was all gonna point to Jesus and we're starting, starting to reveal it, starting to open that up here this morning. The Israelite people were learning about God, learning about God's nature, learning that God was their deliverer. This was, this was the, f the first major moment for the Israelites as a people 
where God was saying, I'm going to make sure you remember this deliverance point. He'd already always been providing for them. He'd always been guiding them. He'd always been taking care of them. He had great plans for them. He had made a covenant with them. But this was a big moment where he says, I need you to trust me as your deliverer. I'm creating a practice in Passover of you guys remembering to trust me. You can't see that blood outside your door, but you know it's there. You know you made a decision to put it there and put your trust in me. Trust me as your deliverer. He's creating a story so that we can that we can celebrate in our present. We can remember our past, celebrate in our present, and we can recognize our future. Trust in me, trust in this blood as the price paid for your deliverance. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're gonna be talking about all this a lot walking into Easter. This is the story that defines my life. This is the story that I'm a part of that's unfolding before us. These are the stepping stones, these, these pieces of understanding what God has done for us and how much he loves us and who he wants to be in our lives. One of those pieces is he wants to be our deliverer. He loves us so much that he says, I will fight for you. I will fight for your salvation. And so you can you know, be here for the next couple of weeks and learn more and more and more of these pieces, this symbolism, these traditions that all tie together to help remind us of this truth. But I'm sharing it with you right here, right now, that, that later in the story, Jesus Christ came and he died as the sacrificial lamb for our salvation. God said, I will be your deliverer. I will deliver you, not just from the Egyptians, but I will deliver you from sin in your life. I'll deliver you from sin so that you can be in relationship with me and you no longer have to be under condemnation or judgment. You're no longer gonna experience separation for eternity in hell, separation from God for eternity in hell, but you can walk in newness of life with me. You can know me and be in relationship with me. You can experience life to the full because you're walking with God by accepting Jesus, his son, who lived a sinless life and died on the cross and then was buried and he resurrected three days later. That's what we celebrate at Easter because he conquered death. You too can conquer death through Jesus and live in life with God. You just have to trust. You have to say, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need a savior. I recognize, just like these people did, that I need a deliverer. Something bad is coming and I need to be delivered. And so Jesus, I'm asking you to deliver me. I accept your free gift of grace for my sin. Please deliver me from that. I will trust you with my life. That's the decision you make. That's the decision you make that then starts to influence everything else you do in life because you're on a new journey, a new story walking with him. If you made that decision with us today and you're in the room or if you're online with us, please tell somebody. Tell one of us. Type it in the comments if you're with us online. Uh, come up and talk to me after service or talk to somebody else you know who's walking with Jesus and tell them that you have made a decision to trust Jesus as your deliverer today. You can do this. This will change everything for you because it gives you new life. Pray with me. Father God, we trust you as our deliverer. We want to walk in the newness of life, fresh, clean, not burdened anymore by the slavery to sin that is our past, but free people, free in you, delivered from sin. Father God, we thank you for this story. We thank you for this celebration. We thank you for Passover. We thank you for these stepping stones you've given us to understand the truth you want to communicate to us, to understand how much you care about us, how much you love us, how far you are willing to go to be a part of our lives. And Father, we reciprocate that love to you here today. We say, yes, Father, we love you too. And we are following you as our Lord. Amen.
All right, guys, thank you so much for coming to worship with us today. I thank you for um, reading along in your scriptures with us. This stuff may seem hard to grasp at first, but our time together is profitable. Our time together is meaningful because we dive into this and we say, what does this really mean, God? What are you trying to tell us? And so this time together, working through Passover has been so rich and we are gonna continue next week looking at timeline because there's significance. God created time and there's significance to doing things in God's timing. And so we're gonna look at that together next week and we're gonna start tying that ever so closely to Jesus as we see the timeline of how God played out events in Jesus' life as we walk towards Easter. Okay, looking forward to that. I uh, love and I'm honored to be your pastor and you guys mean a lot to me. I love you all very much. Have a great week and be blessed.